I want to talk to you a few minutes this morning about uh, <coughs> Christian joy, if I might. <coughs> the Bible says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Now think of that statement just a minute. The joy of the Lord is our strength. I've learned down through the years that most people are not going to do anything unless they really want to do it. Now the law can require us to do certain things and the government and that type of thing, but other than that, we're not going to do very much unless we really want to do it. And the scripture says that the joy of the Lord is my strength. And I do what I do as a Christian because I enjoy, I have the joy of the Lord in my heart and life, and therefore I do that. <clears throat> That's a pretty powerful, pretty powerful thing. In Psalm 40, the psalmist said, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined his ear unto me. He heard my cry. He brought me up out of a horrible pit. He doesn't say what, pit, what kind of a pit it was. It was a horrible pit. And set my feet upon a rock. He has established my goings. He has put a new song are you listening? He has put a new song in my heart, and many will see it and shall come to praise the Lord. We've been talking in past days about seeing our faith. We live a life so people can see that Christ lives in our hearts and lives. Many shall see it and shall come to praise the Lord. Now, I learned a long, long time ago that the only way, the only way that we were ever going to have meaning and purpose in life was when we truly found out who it is that we really are. If someone would ask you this morning, who are you? What would you say? You'd, you'd probably tell him your name. Well, I'd take a little different approach to that. If you'd ask me this morning who I am, I'd say I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And then I'm Parker Heinzman. You see. So it is with us who have found Christ as our Savior and Lord and live for Him today. Uh, <clears throat> I can honestly say, although it's been important to me, I can honestly say that I'd do what I'm doing today if, I, if you didn't pay me. Don't, don't take that at heart. <laughs> but I do what I'm doing today, honestly, for nothing. I am working as hard today for you as I've ever worked for anybody, believe me. <clears throat> the joy of the Lord is our strength. Because Christ lives in my heart and life, the joy bubbles up. Now, <clears throat> there's a big difference between happiness and joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, believe me. Happiness is based on external things. It's, it's based on things like money and automobiles and houses and other people jobs and, and pleasures and a lot of other things. 
But the joy of the Lord is not based on any of that. It's based on Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Listen to this. There's 52, 55 references of joy in the Bible. More than that, I'm sure. I found 55. Listen to some of these. Jesus prayed in his high priestly prayer that they may have my joy fulfilled in their lives. He was praying for the disciples. That they may have my joy fulfilled in their lives. In Hebrews 12, 2, the writer's talking about Jesus and it says this, For the joy that was set before him, he bore the cross, despised the shame, and is sit down at the right hand of God the Father. Paul prayed in prison that he might finish the course which God had set out for him with joy in my heart. In, <clears throat> in Psalm 51, you have the prayer of penance that David prayed after he had sinned against Bathsheba and her husband. And David offers up this prayer when he found out that he was a sinner. And this is how he prayed. He prayed that God would restore unto him the joy of his salvation. Now, evidently, when he sinned, he lost his joy because he broke his relationship with God. And he asked God to restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Then, then he said, I will teach once again sinners your ways and they will be converted unto you. Now, if there's a difference between happiness and a difference between that and joy, and there is, then we must know that because Christ lives in the world and lives in our heart and in our lives, we know that joy. When Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit to the church of Galatia, he says this, the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace. Now, those three things are gifts from God. It's not something they earned. Love, joy, and peace. I've experienced the love of God and therefore I love. I experienced Jesus Christ and therefore I have joy. I'm at peace with God and myself, and therefore I have peace, love, joy, and peace. Now, joy expresses itself in more ways than we will ever be able to recount here this morning. We have a tendency, I think, in the church, maybe not, but I think, in the church to see joy as something that people demonstrate like they do at, at sports events, that kind of joy. But no, it's, it may be that, but it's far more than that. Bishop Kennedy, for example, was doing a Bible study one day at, in California at the Bible school there and right in the middle of his lesson, an older gentleman got up and started walking up and down the aisles, waving his hands and praising God. Bishop Kennedy just stopped till he got through, and when he got through, he went over and back to his seat and sat down. His wife stood up and said, I act, I feel just like my husband acted. Do you see the difference in expressions of Christian joy? I feel just like my husband acted. 
I have the same joy in my heart and life. And though I just sat here, he got up and rejoiced. Have you ever sat beside of someone who went to an athletic event and everybody was jumping and hollering and hooping and he just sat there? Well, you haven't gone with me because that's what I do. <laughs> and do I, do I not ex experience it any less than those who are waving their hands and yelling? No. It's just that I'm expressing it a different way. Joy is that way. I feel just like my husband acted. You understand? <laughs> well, that's the way it is. Uh, I don't know whether you've ever experienced this or not, but I've been in churches where I've seen people shout up and down the aisles across the front of the church and one or two people even walk the pews because of an expression of joy. But in the midst of all that that was going on, there were others who just sat there who was filled with the same joy. You see. Emotionally, we react different ways in all this. And so we know it to be true. Now, how do we know that, <clears throat> how do we know what are the expectations that we have that we know about when, when we have Christmas, Christian joy. What produces that in our life? I want to name three very quickly with you this morning. First of all, when we experience joy in our hearts, it's because of God's forgiveness. Now, friends, it is the most wonderful thing in all the world to know that though I have sinned, yet God forgives me of that sin. Did you know that? Isn't that wonderful? That God would forgive me of my sin. Am I worthy of that? No, I'm not. Do you have to be worthy? No, you don't. But God forgives you and me of our sin. Now, we have practically explained sin away. You don't hear very much said about sin in churches today unless you hear it here. But we know that sin is a reality. And how do we know it's a reality? All you have to do is to look around in the lives of people and you see the fruit that it produces in their lives. <clears throat> there are people today out there, and maybe some here, I don't know, who life is just in shambles because of unconfessed sin in their heart and life. Christ died on the cross as he hung there suspended between heaven and earth to say, forgive them, Father, they know not what they do. His experience tells us that God will forgive you and forgive me of my sin, regardless. Now, it, it's a pretty amazing thing. I remember a young man who was dying of polio and who I went to see, who had never been in a church the day of his life, 17 years old, in an iron lung, lay there, and they thought for sure he would die. And he did die. But when I got to him, he was still very, very much awake and conscious. And I said to him, do you know that God loves you? And then I explained to him how Christ died for him. And he said to me, could I be baptized? I said, sure. I asked the nurse for a glass of water, and she brought me a glass of water, and I baptized him, and just his head sticking out of an arm and lung, baptized him. And he looked up at me, and tears streaming down his cheeks. And this is what he said. 
this is the happiest day of my life. Friends, I want to tell you, <laughs> I would have thought that the happiest day of his life is when he had a family, when he had something to eat, when he had something to wear, when Christmas came along, Thanksgiving came along, had a girlfriend or didn't have a girlfriend. Happiest day of his life. But no, the happiest day of my life is right now in this iron lung. Two weeks later, he went to be at Jesus. Oh, the forgiveness of God will stir up a bubble in your heart and life and in mine. I've been forgiven. Thanks be to God. Secondly, we know that when we forgive others, it stirs up the joy in our heart and life as well. Now that's the only part of the Lord's Prayer that Jesus bothered to say anything about, but he ran a commentary on it. And he said this, Unless you are willing to forgive others their trespasses, your Father will not forgive you your trespasses. That's pretty powerful stuff. I've said this before, and I want to say it again this morning. That the only way that you will ever have a happy life and a happy marriage and have a happy community is when you're willing to forgive each other and accept forgiveness. Willing to forgive each other and accept forgiveness. I think that that is the most profound thing that can happen to you or to me. I remember one night in a revival meeting, an evangelistic services we were in, <clears throat> the church had some problems. It was divided by some people in the church. And I finally got them all to come to the front of the altar to pray for the meeting as we were starting. And we all knelt and believe it or not, everybody began to pray. And all of a sudden people started getting up from the altar and going from one side of the room to the other and falling into each other's arms and crying and saying, I love you. The division was gone. Revival was beginning, you see. It's amazing, it's amazing what happens to you and to me. And we live in a world where we have something against someone else, they're all willing to forgive. When we finally forgive, tears of joy come flooding out of our hearts and our lives. Don't they? Don't they? It's so with forgiveness of wife, forgiveness of husband, forgiveness of neighbor, forgiveness of children, on and on and on it goes. You have joy because you are forgiven and you forgive others their trespasses. Thirdly, we need to understand that we are, in most cases, much too hard upon ourselves. We need to forgive ourselves. We need to forgive ourselves. Why are we so hard on ourselves? We are, aren't we? Really hard. We need to forgive ourselves. And if we would forgive ourselves, <laughs> we'd find out that guilt would be gone. No more guilt over whatever had happened or whatever we'd done. It's all gone, run out. That's what happened to me in a wear room grocery store. I forgave myself and guilt went pouring out, you know. That's what happened to a young couple that came forward one night. They came to the altar and I knew them well. <clears throat> and they had been going together in high school and they went too far and she got in trouble and was pregnant. 
they had a child, they got married and had a child. The child was born deformed, terrible shape, and they blamed themselves for that child. And when they came down the aisle, they came down the aisle hand in hand and tears streaming down their cheeks. They knelt at the altar of the church and you could see the guilt pouring out on the floor. Oh, friends, we need to know that God forgives us. And when God forgives us, we need to forgive ourselves. How we need to forgive ourselves. Let it go, let it go, let it go, let it go. God forgives us and claims us as his own and the <coughs> This attitude of joy rushes to the forefront and stirs us to do the will of God in the world today. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right.